Hello everyone, myself Dr. Pratik. So today we will discuss about facial nerve anatomy. So what do you mean by facial nerve? It's a seventh cranial nerve. It's a mixed nerve. Why mixed? Because it consists of motor, sensory as well as parasympathetic fibers. It's a cranial nerve which is seventh in number. So where does facial nerve arises? It arises at the level of the pontomedullary junction. Now look at this slide. Firstly, we have discussed it's a seventh cranial nerve, which is a mixed nerve. It consists of total 10,000 nuclei, out of which the 7,000 nuclei are motor and 3,000 nuclei are sensory. As you can see, suppose this is my pontomabulary junction. So these 7,000 nuclei will form the motor root. It will take a turn around the abducens nuclei. That is a sixth cranial nerve. And then it joins with the sensory root. So this forms my complete facial nerve. Then while exiting from the pontomedullary junction, it enters into internal auditory canal. And this internal auditory canal is a part of the temporal bone. So then after entering into the internal auditory canal, it can exit, forms the first genu and then enters into the middle ear and this from the horizontal part in the middle ear and this from the vertical part in the middle ear and this vertical part then get exit from temporal bone through stylomastoid foramen and this stylomastoid foramen after exiting from this foramen facial now gives, gives multiple branches to various muscles. So this is how we can divide this facial nerve course into three sections. The first section is intracranial which is starting from the bones or medulla junction and until the level of entry into internal auditory canal. This is my intracranial portion and then comes my intratemporal portion that is with the entry into internal auditory canal till the level of stylomastoid foramen. This complete is into the temporal bone. So this is known as intratemporal part. And beyond that, that is my extratemporal part that is outside of temporal bone. Now, this sensory root, it is known as nerve of nervous intermediates or also called nerve of Risberg. Why I am saying this? It has been asked in the exam. The sensory fibers in the facial nerve that, that is known as nervous intermediates or nerve of wrist bulb. And what happens in central facial palsy? What do you mean by central? If the lesion is at the level of central fiber or at the level of the cortical fiber, okay, then in central facial palsy, my forehead will be spared and rest of the face. Uh, to the concerned side would be paralyzed or there will be paralysis. Why the above forehead is spared? Because we all know the fibers, the cortical fibers, they just cross each other. In the brain, what happens? The fiber from the left side, left side, they goes into the right side. Fibers from right side goes into the left side. So if there is a central lesion over the one side, so it also gets supplied from the opposite side. That is the reason the forehead will be spared in the central facial palsy. Again, examination point of view, it is important asked in the exam. Now, here in this presentation, what I prefer, I'll give you just the visual pictures without giving much theory. So my mean, my aim is to make you guys understand how this facial nerve takes a path, how the branches are emerging and how their pathology will affect the various uh, symptoms or various signs. So look at this diagram. This is my seventh cranial nerve, which is known as facial nerve. You can see this is my bones, medulla junction. You can see this is my part of the brain as you can see. And this is my pontomedullary junction. So this is how the spatial nerve get arise. This is intracranial part. And from there it enters into internal auditory canal. You can see a circle here. I'll mark it in the red. You can see this is my internal auditory canal. 
and this is how the station now will enter into IAC that is a part of the temporal bone and then it goes inside take a U-turn that is known as first genu. From this first genu arises the greater petrosal now GSPN greater superficial petrosal now GSPN here you can see this white structure this is the bone shown as a temporal bone and you can see after entering into IAC going towards uh, uh, temporal, going into the temporal bone taking a turn which is known as a first genu it gives a branch which is known as GSPN greater petrosal now and then it enters into the middle ear like this makes a horizontal course and then it takes a vertical turn so this is known as horizontal to vertical my second genu and this is my first genu okay and then it exit from the stylomestoid foramen you can see here this is my stylomestoid foramen so this starting from this level until the level of this stylomestoid foramen this is my intratemporal part of the facial now and it exit from the stylomestoid foramen and gives various muscular branches as you can see now in the temporal bone we all can see the facial nerve is giving three branches the first one is the gsp and this is my first branch the next one is now to stapedius which supplies the stapedius muscle attached to the stapes bone and the third branch is corda tympani now now let's look at the gspn now this gspn now how does it course so it goes ahead enters at the level of the foramen lessenum then it makes relay in the pterygopalatine ganglion you can see this is a ganglion which is known as pterygopalatine ganglion so this gspn will make a relay center or uh, it just uh, uh, relay in the pterygopalatine ganglion and from there it supplies to lacrimal gland, nasal mucosal glands and oral and pharyngeal mucosal glands. So this is, this part is basically secretomotor fibers as they are helpful in secretion of the mucosa into the nose, oral cavity, pharynx and also responsible for lacrimation. Okay, and this also carries sensory fibers from the soft palate. So the sensation from soft palate are also being carried away by the facial now, its branch known as GSPN. Now let's talk about now to stapedius, which supply the stapedius muscle. And you all know that this stapedial muscle when it contracts, it helps the inner ear getting destroyed or uh, destroyed or any injury whenever there is a loud sound because it restricts the extreme vibration of the stapes bone and thus helping the inner ear uh, protection from loud sound. Okay, the third one is corda tympani. You can see this is my corda tympani now, which is going through that petrotympanic fissure. And then, firstly, this corda tympani it carries taste fiber from anterior two third of the tongue. Anterior two third of the tongue, these taste fibers are being carried by the corda tympani now. Plus, this corda tympani it is also carrying secretomotor fiber to submandibular and sublingual glands. So here you can see this is making a relay at the submandibular ganglion and then providing the secretomotor fiber to submandibular and sublingual glands. So this is the function of the facial now. This corda tympani is uh, helpful in secretion of saliva from secrete uh, some mandibular or sublingual salivary gland. There is a difference between production and secretion. This corda tympani just secrete the produced saliva from the salivary gland. It doesn't produce the saliva. So whatever the saliva is being produced in some mandibular and sublingual salivary gland, through the secretomotor fibers, the saliva being secreted through these glands and it carries taste sensation from anterior two third of the tongue. Now tell me posterior one third of the tongue which now is responsible to carry the taste sensation. The answer is glossopharyngeal nerve that is the ninth cranial nerve. Okay so anterior two third facial nerve 
posterior one third glossophalangeal nerve i am talking about the taste sensation from the tongue i hope anatomy is little bit clear how it enters from the brain way uh, brain into the internal auditory canal then going into the middle ear exiting from the stylonostrad foramen and giving various muscular branches i discuss you there are three branches in the temporal bone first one is greater superficial the dorsal nerve responsible for uh, lacrimation the mucosal secretions in the nose oral cavity pharynx etc next now is now to step area and the third now is cauda tympani now another simplified diagram just to make you understand about the anatomy of facial nerve now look at this diagram this is my central compartment of the facial now where we can see the fibers are criss cross the fibers are going from one side towards opposite side so that's the reason suppose my pathology at this level this is my central lesion so some of the fiber from opposite side will goes and form the facial nerve so suppose lesion is this side that is my central facial nerve lesion so my forehead will be spared because it carries now fiber from opposite side also and suppose if the lesion is at this level where both the fiber already bicuspid or go from the facial nerve now if the lesion is this side so complete half of the face will be affected okay getting what do you mean by upper motor neuron lesion and lower motor neuron lesion suppose this is my l m n and lesion is upper then that is known as upper motor u m n okay so in upper motor neuron lesion forehead will be spared of one side and the rest of the face will be paralyzed over that side but in lower motor neuron uh, lower motor neuron lesion complete half of the face towards same side will be affected okay now look at this facial now this is my abducens nucleus as in the center you can see okay so this facial or motor fiber will taking a turn at the abducens nucleus and mixing with the sensory fibers that is the nervous intermedius and entering into the internal auditory canal so this is my temporal part and then they run into internal temporal internal auditory canal and exit through this ic internal acoustic nucleus and internal auditory canal then they take a sharp turn to form the greater petrosal nerve and this sharp turn is known as geniculate ganglion that is the first genu it is known as first genu of the facial now so i told you told you this gspn function then this facial now will run into the middle ear takes a horizontal course which is known as horizontal part of the facial now and again it takes a u sharp turn which is known as second genu of the facial now and then it runs vertically giving the branches cauda tympani or the nerve to stapedius stapedial nerve and cauda tympani and then it get exit from stylonostoid foramen and giving terminal branches while running into the parotid gland these branches are like frontal ophthalmic oral and etc other branches we will discuss everything okay so i hope this much part is clear uh, this part Uh, exiting from the stylonostrate foramen this is extra temporal part from internal auditory canal till the level of the stylonostrate foramen is a intra temporal part now so let's discuss about intra temporal part which is the facial of course into the temporal bone so the, there are this is there are four parts first one is the meter that means the facial now running in the internal auditory canal so that is known as a meter part then after exit from the meatus it takes a sharp turn which is known as the first genu and enters into the middle ear so that much part is known as labyrinthine part the third part which is known as tympani part is a horizontal part of the facial now in the middle ear that is tympani part and then again it will make a sharp turn to form the second genu and then it runs vertically into the mesial cavity which is known as vertical part so in temporal bone it has four parts now first one is the meatal part that is the part into internal acoustic canal internal auditory canal so first part it is around 8 to 10 mm long 
okay and the meter bar it is supplied by the labyrinthine artery and this labyrinthine artery is a branch of antero inferior cerebellar artery so so labyrinthine artery is a branch of anterior inferior cerebellar artery now comes the labyrinthine part is it is the narrowest part and the shortest part it is around 3 to 4 mm and again asked in the exam the shortest and the narrowest part of the facial nerve is labyrinthine part which is around 3 to 4 mm and this is the part which is most commonly compressed in any viral infection because it's such narrow any infection with the slight edema will cause a compression over the facial nerve so in any viral infection like the herpes zoster you can say or any herpes simplex or anything the most common part affect is in labyrinthine part and this part again is supplied by the labyrinthine artery just try to remember the inner ear the facial nerve in the internal auditory canal or the labyrinthine part these all are supplied by the anterior inferior cerebellar artery branches and the facial nerve part are supplied by the labyrinthine artery but ica anterior inferior cerebellar artery is the artery responsible to supply the inner ear or related branches now in the middle ear when the facial nerve enters the part known as the tympanic part which is around 11 mm and this is the site for dehiscence because mostly naturally the facial canal is dehiscent in the horizontal part that is tympanic part so it is most common site of dehiscence again examination point of view it is important asked in previous years now this tympanic part is supplied by the superior petrosal artery which is a branch of middle meningeal artery we know the middle meningeal artery uh, giving supply the blood supply to the middle ear just try to recall the middle ear blood supply so from the anterior wall the branches from the middle meningeal artery enters so tympanic part is will be supplied by the middle meningeal artery branch that is superior petrosal artery and then comes the vertical part which runs into the uh, mastoid it is the longest part 13 mm long and it is supplied by the stylomastoid artery just try to remember vertical part the facial artery exit from the stylomastoid foramen so the blood supply will be stylomastoid artery that is a branch of the posterior auricular artery now again one simplified diagram just to show how many fibers are in there in the facial nerve so this red one is the motor fiber or we can say efferent okay so this red one is the motor fiber and if we talk about the blue that is a sensory fiber okay you can see here sensory then yellow one is the parasympathetic fiber this yellow is parasympathetic okay we already it's marketed so let's see these motor fiber in the facial nerve they are going inside making the first gen that is a geniculate ganglion and giving the first part that is a gspn nerve this is gspn and in this gspn you can see the parasympathetic fibers are there which are marked in the yellow color and these are the secretomotor fiber which relay in the pterygopalatine ganglion and then supply to lacrimal gland nasal gland etc and thus helps in uh, secretion of the uh, these tears in the eyes so that's the reason any facial or lesion or pathology will lead to dryness of the eye because there will be less lacrimation okay now as you can see the motor fiber they are going inside the first branch first part motor fiber they are supplied to nerve of uh, stapedius so helps in stapedius uh, muscle contraction and then further they are giving the auricular branches stylohyoid to digastric branches and to the facial muscles in the parotid gland we all know the five structure i'll tell you so these are the motor fiber and then comes the sensory fibers so what does these sensory fibers they just go and they force the sensory fiber they go with the cauda tympani this is my cauda tympani now 
okay and from this coordinate impediment now so firstly they will delay in the sub mandibular ganglion and then they will supply to the sub mandibular subliqual gland and helps in secretion of saliva so this facial now lesion what will cause dryness in the mouth because there will be less salivation and tongue it carries the uh, taste sensation from the anterior two third of the tongue so i hope just to simplify with the help of the diagram so i hope the facial now let me you are more easier now let's discuss about the branches i told you intertemporal part there are only three branches the first branch is gspm get a superficial petrosal second is nerve to stapes and third is corda tympani now and suppose this nerve to stapes is got injured what will happen i told you so stapes bone will be uh, when whenever there is a loud sound so it will be uh, more vibrating and these vibration will directly get transmitted into the inner ear so this may damage the sensory part of the inner ear that is the outer ear cell we can say or the uh, the part responsible for the hearing okay so these are sensory neuroepithelium may get damage so that's why facial nerve plays a protective role also okay and this coda tympani for the taste sensation and for the salivation extra temporal part of the facial nerve the first branch while exiting from the stylomastoid foramen it gives a auricular branch we all know in the external auditory canal we all know the posterior superior part is being supplied by the facial nerve branch okay so uh, it gives uh, muscular supply to the auricular branch then nerve to stylohyoid muscle and the digastric muscle see this is my mastoid bone suppose this is my mastoid bone and this is my mastoid tip and anteriorly here comes the eac this is e external auditory canal and beyond that below uh, beneath that there is a mastoid bone so this is my mastoid tip this is my tip and at this mastoid tip over the medial side that means towards the body this is my lateral side and if i go inside that is the medial side so medial side the digastric muscle is attached okay so this digastric muscle is being supplied by the facial nerve and what are the terminal branches when it exits from the stylomastoid foramen and then enters into the parotid gland substance it gives five branches what are the five branches let put your hand over the face so first branch is temporal okay as it is going on the temporal the next branch is zygoma zygomatic and third branch is buccal over the buccal cavity fourth branch is mandibular because it is running over the mandible and the fifth branch is cervical going in the neck so five branches temporal zygomatic buccal then comes the mandibular and comes the cervical branch now again important part surgical landmark for the facial now so look at this diagram in the middle here it is uh, surgically also important and examination point of view very important so there are multiple surgical landmark the first one is processus cochlear formis so what is processus uh, cochlear formis it is a bony projection you can see here this is my processus uh, cochlear formis so the facial now or we can say geniculate ganglion that is a first ganglion lies in front of it Uh, what is the correct position anterior and superior so this is processus cochlear formis so the first genu it is lying anterior and superior to it so again this is a surgical landmark the next landmark comes a lateral semicircular canal and the oval window so you can see this is my oval window and this is lateral semicircular canal so facial nerve is running in between lateral semicircular canal and oval window so it it represent again a surgical landmark the third landmark is short process of incus so whenever we open up the mastoid cavity suppose this is my external auditory canal and this is my mastoid cavity okay so what happens whenever we drill at this area whenever we drill at the mastoid area we drill at this area so once we reach the antrum we can appreciate the short process of incus so just try to find out the short process of incus facial nerve is immediately medial to that so it again serve as a short process of incus serve as a surgical landmark the facial nerve is very important whenever we are doing the posterior tympanotomy technique or the facial nerve decompression surgery so it serves an important landmark the fourth landmark is the digastric ridge 
So I already told you at the mastoid tip over the medial side digastric muscles are uh, attached to the mastoid bone. So this form a ridge. So facial nerve is always medial to this digastric ridge. And whenever we are doing the superficial parotidectomy, so again this digastric nerve ridge will serve as a landmark because so, suppose we have given incision for the superficial parotidectomy. So we just try to find out the digastric muscles insertion into the mastoid bone. And once we look at the digastric thing, we know that facial nerve will be medial to that, not lateral to that. And last landmark is the coke. Coke is an again a uh, bony uh, uh, projection, bony projection, or we can say bony ridge. Now, top load diagnostic test. Many, many times examiner has asked the question about this topo diagnosis. So he will frame the question like the patient is having uh, the loss of the lacrimation, loss of the saliva and everything. So tell about, tell us about the site of lesion of the facial nerve. So to understand this, firstly, we will draw the facial nerve diagram. So we all know, suppose this is my internal auditory canal. Okay, so this is my IAC. And how this facial nerve runs? So after emerging from the pontum medullary junction, this facial nerve enters into IAC, then forms a first genu, and then takes a horizontal course again form a second genu, and then runs vertically, and then exiting from the stylomastoid foramen, and then gives multiple branches into the parotid gland. Understood? This much we have understood. This is stylomastoid foramen. Stylomastoid foramen. And this is my first genu. Uh, okay, I need to. Uh, so, this is suppose my first branch that is the GSPN. And then comes my second branch, that is the now two stapedius. And then comes my third branch, third branch is corda tympani now. Okay. Now, this is a very simple diagram. Just try to recall everything. So, suppose Sherma test. Sherma test is basically done to check about the level of the lacrimation in the eye. What we do, we will use a paper. Uh, what kind of paper? You can uh, say there is a tissue paper, you can use a tissue paper, litmus paper or blotting paper are there. So what we'll do, we'll put the paper into the eye over the uh, lateral phonics of the eye uh, towards the lateral canthus, uh, inferiorly. Inferiorly, we'll put a strip of the paper and we will look how much wet it goes, how much wetting is there as compared with the examiner or the, with the normal eye. So it should be wet properly. That is suggestive of the proper lacrimation is there. So suppose my lesion is supragenuclate. What do we mean by supragenuclate? Supragenuclate, it means my lesion is at this level, above the level of the first genu, that is a supragenuclate. So just we will understand. Suppose my lesion is supragenuclate. So what will happen? All the three branches will get paralyzed. Understood? Suppose my lesion is at this level, so this will get affected GSPN, now to stapedius, cotta tintani, and all muscular branches. So every function will be lost. Got it? Simple. If the lesion is supragenuclate, suppose at this level, so this much now, uh, the now uh, beyond this, I mean now before this, with the normal, but all the branches are after this first genu or at the level of the first genu. So if lesion is supragenuclate, Every function of the facial now will be lost. Understood. Suppose my lesion is after first genu, that is infragenuclate. So what will happen? All the structure, all the nerves, like stapedial function will be lost. Taste sensation from the cotta tympani or salivation from the seminal gland will be lost. And this motor fiber will be lost. Because any pathology at this level, so after the facial nerve part, after this, the function will be lost. And before this is lies a GSPN will be still functioning. So if the lesion is my uh, infragenuclate, uh, we can say uh, after, uh, that is after first genu. So only the lacrimation from the eyes will be normal. The mucus secretion from the oral cavity, pharyngeal cavity, or nasal cavity will be normal. But now to stapedius, cotta tympani, or the motor branches function will be lost. Again, okay. if suppose my lesion is after now to stapedius, again very much simple. 
So these two nerves will be spared. So function of nerve to stapedes and GSPN will be preserved. But the portion of the facial nerve distal to the stapedes nerve will be lost. So quadrant tympanic function will be lost. And suppose my lesion is at the level of corda this uh, cylonestroid foramen. So all these three branches function will be preserved. But these motor supply to the facial nerve function will be lost. This is very simplified. Now try to understand uh, looking at this topo diagnostic test. Now, Schirmer test. So, what do you mean by Schirmer test? In supraganiculate lesion, that means the lesion at this level, at this level, so Schirmer test, the lacrimation will be decreased or lost. So, this test will be negative. Okay? But if the lesion is suprastapedian, that is above this level, at this level, or infrastapedial or infracordial, that means level B, below than that. So, in these cases, GSPN is still preserved. So, lacrimation will be affected only when the lesion is at level of supragenoculate. Very simple, just try to recall this diagram, just try to uh, make a diagram in your mind or whenever examination examiner want to ask such questions just draw a diagram over the rough paper and you can easily solve each and every question without getting any wrong answer now suppose if we talk about the stapedius reflex so if my lesion is supragenoculate that means at this level first level so again every function will be lost so this is negative here if my supraestapedial again negative if my lesion is infraestapedial that means at this level, infrastapedial. So now to stapedius is preserved. So stapedial reflex will be preserved. So again, we can see in all other lesions like this. If we talk about the motor fibers, so motor fibers are the terminal branches. So any pathology above than that, any facial nerve lesion above than that will definitely result in motor loss because the fibers are coming from upside now, from the starting. So if there is pathology above than that, so all the motor function will be lost. So that's how you can solve each and every question. I hope this is clear.